All right, I think we'll get started. I know people will be joining. Um, get my, uh, just welcome to our session on nutrition. Uh, my name is Dave Tesler. I'm the, uh, in this context, the youth chair of US USATF uh, New England. Um, we all have multiple hats, of course. Um, I think we've gotten done a good job here with the housekeeping up front. Uh, we've got uh, everyone on mute, and only the people on mute can take yourself off. None of us can take you off. So if you're speaking and want to ask a question, uh, you'll have to find that mute button. I'll be monitoring chat um, as we go along. So this uh, nutrition talk is you know, part of a program that the USATF New England Board approved back in January um, that we're calling 2 plus 22. So we spent a, a good amount of time and focus on coach education and, tr and training and what we do at practice. Um, but for the practice to take, you know, what do we do that in the 22 hours away from practice? So this program is trying to drive awareness and enablement around uh, things that impact uh, our performance on and off the field, on and off uh, the track. Um, we're all very familiar with the, uh, the workouts as our 400 repeats, our weight room work, our pylos, whatever it might be. But for that to take, you know, we have to think about the other 22 hours and that's in this equation here, the rest plus fuel. Um, so stress plus rest plus fuel equals growth. You end up eating all three to get there. And obviously today we're going to focus on uh, the fueling uh, part uh, of this uh, equation. So before we um, introduce our speakers, I just want to highlight our most recent uh, Athlete of the Month uh, for February, Mo Molly Seidel. Uh, in February, Molly earned a spot on the Olympic team by finishing second at the Olympic trials uh, in Atlanta. Um, she lives and trains here in Boston now, um, and only 25 Molly has accumulated quite a list of accomplishments. But like many of us, uh, her journey wasn't a straight line and won't be a straight line. She's dealt with significant issues uh, with multiple stress fractures that she connects back to her issues with nutrition. I invite you to read a little bit more about uh, Molly, but I you know, want to share as we transition to our speakers, you know, her quote here at the bottom that you know, long-term health is more important than running a fast 5K three months from now. And um, running a 3K, a 5K three months from now seems like a pretty good idea, no matter how fast you go, given the, uh, the current state. But uh, here's wisdom from an Olympian uh, as we uh, transition uh, into this talk about uh, nutrition. So let me introduce our speakers uh, with us here, Laura Moretti and Nicole Farnsworth, um, both uh, part of Boston Children's Hospital Sports uh, Medicine Department. Um, registered dietitian, certified di dietitians. Uh, Nicole um, is a, a former multi uh, at Harvard, so she knows uh, the track and field is more than running. She knows jumps, she knows throws, and uh, she might even acknowledge that there's walking involved in, in track and field. Um, Laura is a marathoner and a triathlete, um, and both have worked with uh, youth across multiple sports um, and these concepts that they'll share with us and make us aware of are universal. Some, you know, some of our athletes are track and field athletes in the fall or just in the spring, playing basketball, hockey, many other things uh, across uh, across the uh, calendar. We all look forward to getting back to that. Uh, so, Laura and Nicole, I'll turn it over to you. Um, if you can, I think if you push the right buttons, you can share your uh, presentation, and I'll let you. Uh, further that introduction as appropriate. Great, thank you, David. I am getting this talk up right now. We are all learning lots of technology these days, aren't we? Um, okay, Nicole, are you on with me? I am. <clears throat> Excellent. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having us. It's such it's such a pleasure to be here, and I think the timing couldn't be better to do some uh, some virtual learning. Um, in this very strange environment we're living in now, but it it really is a good time to be thinking um, about laying the groundwork, and especially nutrition is something that we can all be working on um, now to really get ready for you know whenever that next season is. So um, yeah, so Nicole and I let's let's get rolling, shall we? We're going to kind of pass this back and forth, and and both kind of jump in and uh, and get rolling here. <clears throat> 
Okay, so what is our agenda for today? First, we want to go through uh, a nutrition overview. So I know when Nicole and I both present, we always like to make sure that everybody is really on the same page um, with understanding what we mean when we say a carbohydrate, what we mean when we say a protein or a fat, because there is, you know, an incredible amount of misinformation out there. So, you know, going to reputable sources, um, such as, you know, Nicole and I, who are both registered dietitians, um, to get the, the real facts, the real information. So hopefully today we can <clears throat> clarify any myths that are out there, but that will be nutrition overviews, a little bit of nutrition school. Another one of our favorite tools that we will talk through next is called the Athlete's Plate. And um, that's a really, really wonderful visual tool that can help you <clears throat> figure out how you should be structuring your meals at different times in your training, right? When your volume's maybe a little bit higher or a little bit lower. Um, but we, we use that a lot. We use that on the daily, I would say. Um, nutrient timing. So this is going to be uh, focusing on how to fuel before, during, and and after um, after training. So we get this is probably Nicole. Would you agree? This is probably one of the um, the biggest questions we get from our from our patients and parents. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. especially in track and field and in the sports that'll last like all day tournaments, all day meets. Like how to how to sustain um, for sure. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that's a, that's an important topic. The next one, we're going to talk a bit more about health implications. Um, and there's been a lot of this in, you know, the, the news over the past few months, especially, uh, you know, with, with Mary Kane coming out and, and really speaking about um, some of the struggles that, that she's faced in her own, in her own running career. So this is going to really focus on what happens when that energy balance is off and what are the potential physical um, consequences as well as performance consequences. So this one is particularly a passionate uh, passion of Nicole's and mine and, and our female athlete program at Boston Children's really uh, focuses on this as well. So we will get into that. Then a little bit on vitamins and minerals. What do you, you know, what do we recommend paying attention to? Do you need to be taking supplements and vitamins? Do you not need to be? We'll get into that. Um, Hydration, um, always an important topic, especially as the temperature is getting warmer. And then um, actually, it also says questions on there, but it looks like it got cut off. But we have made sure we leave time for questions. too. So let's get rolling, shall we? Right, absolutely. So our first section is really going to be about what sets the athlete apart and things that we're thinking about and considering when we're working with our athletes and especially our youth athletes. Um, we do see athletes of all ages. Uh, I think the youngest I have is is nine, and it goes on up into adulthood. Um, Laura, you, how do you probably deal with a similar range? Yeah, um, I say my youngest is I think about six or seven, and my oldest patient is an eighty-five year old cyclist. So yes, <laughs> all ages, <laughs> all, all ages, um, and a lot of our and men, much of our work focuses in on the youth, uh, the children, adolescents, college students. Um, so when we're thinking about what sets the athlete apart. What sets apart an athlete from a non-athlete, but then also towards the bottom, like what kind of things are we considering with our youth athletes? So um, the first one we have really is like performance goals. So as an athlete, um, I imagine if you're a coach, it is speaking about your athletes, or if you're an athlete yourself, you want to do your sport and do it well. And um, as we were talking about in the introduction with the two by 22 model, that rest, that fuel, that recovery work it can really pay off when it comes to performance and having that knowledge and applicability. An athlete has higher energy and fueling needs than a non-athlete. So, you know, we want to make sure that the athlete is accounting for that um, and really thinking about the fact that they need, need more food than their peers. They may need to eat more often uh, to help keep them fueled, to keep them uh, ready for practice, ready mm -hmm. for recovery and performance. And uh, thinking about our youth athletes, they are growing bodies, um, which our next slide will really go into in a lot of ways. But, you know, there's extra energy needs accounted for the growing athlete, the developing athlete, as one is developing bone mass, muscle, um, you know, going through pure puberty and things like that. So we want to account for that and make sure we're covering our bases there as well. And I like to say this, especially about like high school and college, I know Laura does as well, is that we deal with student athletes in a lot of cases. So a lot of the principles we're going to teach today and really 
you know, discuss are about fueling the body as well as the brain. So really helping also with, uh, you know, concentration and things along those lines. And we also want you to feel good while, while you're having fun, while you're enjoying competition. Because when we feel good, we tend to be more relaxed, more confident. And so if we can give that confidence and that knowledge, then hopefully that can translate out, out onto the track and the field. Yeah, exactly. So I will break down what this graph is explaining here. But um, as Nicole was mentioning, our athletes are youth athletes that are that are growing, right? There's a lot of change that's going on in bodies during adolescence, right? One of the biggest things um, we work with an, an incredible uh, sports endocrinologist, uh, Dr. Kate Ackerman, at um, Boston Children's Hospital, and we do we focus a lot on bone health. So. If you take a look at the chart um, on your screen there, if you really focus in on that, um, the, the age in, in years is, is across the, uh, the axis there on the bottom, you see age 10 to 20. If you notice how steep that curve is, what that indicates is the amount of bone mineral density that is being laid down by the body. So this, the steepest point of the curve is if really if you look from like zero to 20, um, males develop bone density a little bit uh, until a little bit later into their 20s, where females really uh, should reach their peak bone mass by about age 22, approximately 18 to 22. We, we kind of use that range. So one of the reasons that we are so aggressive with our growing athletes is this is such a, a period of growth uh, maturation and development. Um, it's also ligaments, um, not just the bones, but all that connective tissue. There's there's a tremendous amount of growth, right? And, and our youth growing at all different times, right? They sort of sprout up at, um, at different points and people do hit um, puberty and things like that at different points. But something that we speak a lot about, and, and David mentioned this um, when talking about, about Molly in the, in the intro, was that stress fractures are a major issue that we do see in in athletes? Um, I always say they're not completely preventable as athletes. We do we do get injuries, right? But if we can do as much as we possibly can to to prevent that. So when we're thinking about what does prevention look like in these adolescent years, there's a few things that we think about. Um, for for our female athletes, we. The, the research says in our recommendation is we want to see a female athlete getting her menstrual period by about 15 and a half uh, years of age, because basically bone mass accrual occurs concurrently with increase in hormonal levels in the body. So if a female, let's say using that example, is is low on estrogen, she's not sort of getting to that maturity point, she's going to lag in her bone development, which was going to make her more susceptible to stress injuries. Now, even though males have obviously different hormones in their body, we're going to talk about this a bit more later, but males, testosterone, right? There, there's still hormone levels that we do track in males. So a male who's also not getting in enough nutrition, enough calories to support what they're doing could also have a negative impact on their bone density building, which can lead them much more susceptible um, to a stress fracture and a stress injury. So if you think about it, really what you're doing during your adolescent years is going to set the stage for what's going to happen later in life, right? A, a teenager might not, or an adolescent might not care too much about the risk of osteoporosis when they're, you know, 60, but having stress injuries and being out of their sport is a real concern. And Nicole, how many athletes do we see in their twenties and thirties and forties that maybe had these issues during adolescence, yeah. didn't address them. And now we're sort of left trying to repair the damage, but it's, it's, it's delayed, right? It's, it's kind of hard. We can't go back to these bone building years. Absolutely. And right. so we really, absolutely, Lauren. So we really yeah. try to capitalize on those bone building years if we can get an athlete in and thinking about it at that time. Mm -hmm. Yep. yep. So um, the other, oh, I'm sorry. We're if oh, yeah. to you off. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Nicole and I are having a little bit of, uh, you know, it's, we're, we're used to being together all day, every day. So uh, uh, <laughs> separation <laughs> anxiety here. Um, <laughs> The other thing we speak a lot about, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, so I won't get too into it, but, you know, the biggest thing, so basically when we're thinking about bone health, we're thinking about um, this idea of an energy balance, so getting in enough calories to cover the energy expenditures, and not just getting in those calories, but also we want to really 
look at the amount of calcium um, that's coming in in the diet as well as vitamin D. And again, I won't I won't spoil that. We'll uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but that's another important component. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So. Next, we're going to transition to uh, Nutrition School 101, as Laura was introducing in the beginning. And so we're going to go through the three macronutrients. And normally, I'd want to quiz you that opportunity, which is okay. Um, so we're really going to go through, yeah, the three big macronutrients, um, carbohydrates, protein, and fat. And so we'll, we'll take it all one by one, talk about why they're important, what their sources are um, in the diet, and what they do for us in the body. That sandwich looks good right now. Is anyone else getting ready for lunch? I know I am, so yeah. um, it's making me hungry. Um, so <laughs> carbohydrates. So as Nicole said, usually this would be a point where we would have people raise their hands and and tell us what they know about carbohydrates. And I know when I spoke to the the Waltham Track Club, um, we had a great group there, and uh, you know people were very energetic in their responses. And usually the first thing people say when I ask them what is a carbohydrate? It's 99% of the time I get bread, right? People yell out bread. Um, so yes, that is a carbohydrate. I have some lovely pictures to make you a little bit more hungry. Um, but carbohydrates really, the, the, the word I always like people to associate with carbohydrates is energy. So carbohydrates are your body's number one energy source. So th these are the things that your body is really looking to go towards, especially when you're playing a sport. So these are gonna be the most important when you're running around, when you're getting more aerobic, right? So the more aerobic you are, the more you're running around, it actually increases your body's needs for these carbohydrates. So we're gonna we're gonna do a little bit of science here. I promise not too much. But um, so carbohydrates are yes, they are sugars. They break down in your body to what we call glucose, and I really call glucose the gasoline of the body because that's what really for an athlete is so 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 important. And people really like to hate on carbohydrates, but they're actually so 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 important for energy. Um, and all the research that we have out there continues to point to the fact that carbohydrates are really important and athletes that get the right balance of carbohydrate in the diet outperform, um, especially in the, in the running sphere and um, aerobic sports are going to outperform people who don't get enough carbs. Um, and so your body also stores these guys in your muscle and in your liver. So let's say you're not exercised. Maybe you're having your bowl of pasta for dinner the night before a race day. The next day, your body's going to have that stored energy um, that it's going to draw from when, when you're working out. So some of our examples on this slide are things like pasta, fruit, breads, oatmeal. I could go on for days. I love this food group. Um, Nicole and I both do. We're very fond of it. Um, and I'll let Nicole take you into the different types. Absolutely. Thank you, Laura. So um, going further into carbs, because as Laura said, we could talk about carbs all day. Uh, we like to categorize them in and think about them in the ways that they're processed in the body and used for fuel. So you may have heard of carbs previously as um, simple or complex. And so we actually prefer to use the terminology slow digesting and fast digesting. So I'm going to intro and kind of discuss slow digesting carbs with you. Um, there are carbohydrates that uh, additionally have fiber and protein in, in their structure, which means that they're going to be um, more slowly digested in the body. And instead of having an effect where the glucose, when it's broken down, kind of rushes into the bloodstream, may lead to a little bit of a spike in blood sugar, that fiber and protein slows down breakdown and absorption. So it has more of a stabilizing effect. So you'll get that rise, but it won't necessarily come up and down very quickly. Um, we like to emphasize including these at, at meals. Um, and, you know, these are things that you probably think of may have in your pantry now if uh, the COVID-19 buying sprees haven't depleted your grocery stores. So, mm -hmm. Truth. yep. So things like multigrain pastas, brown rice, whole wheat breads, um, beans, cereal, and, and oatmeal. So these are the kind of sources that will have more of that stabilizing effect. Mm -hmm. I feel like everybody has beans in their house right now, right, Nicole? I know I have many mm -hmm. cans, so. Many cans of beans. Yeah. Non-perishables, yes, exactly. Yeah. 
So we can't talk about slow without talking about fast digesting, right? So these are the ones that kind of the opposite of what Nicole is saying. So these guys contain little to no fiber in them. So they do have a little bit more of what we say, like a, like a spiking effect on the blood sugar, which initially you might think of as not a great side effect, but as an athlete, it's all about timing with these guys. So we like you to focus more on those slow digesting carbohydrates throughout like most of the day. At least half of the grains you're taking in, we like to be more whole grain because they're going to give you more nutrients. They're also going to help you stay fuller for longer, um, which is also a good tip now that we're all kind of stuck inside and, and some people are kind of struggling with that grazing and continuing to go into the kitchen. It's good to have meals that are going to kind of stick with you, right? But when we think about these faster digesting ones, these are the ones we really love around sport. And the reason being is we kind of want that energy. We want that body to be ready to go with that those blood sugar levels being a little bit spiked because that's going to give your body something to really draw on quickly. So these are used like when you think about right before a workout, um, we will talk a little bit more about this. So again, I won't go too far into it, but eating something um, or even drinking something like this is where like our Gatorades, uh, Gatorade or sport drinks come into play. If you're someone that maybe doesn't like to eat right before you work out. Um, I love the, like the honey sting. I love big fan of honey stinger products. So they have those little like chews um, or the Gatorade chews, which just give you a little bit of simple sugar, which could be a great thing to keep in a bag, in a backpack, especially if you're at a meet all day, all of a sudden it's your event is up and you need a little bit of energy. These guys are going to be really good for that. And they are also used in recovery because your muscles are looking for readily available sources of carbohydrate to replenish. Remember I said carbs are stored in your muscle. So for your body to recover, it wants easy carbs that are nice and available, right? It doesn't want things it's going to have to work too hard to get. So um, uh, things like pretzels are also great or um, dried cereal. Like I know some, some of my athletes do like uh, even like make a mix of like Cheerios and raisins and like keep it in a little baggie. Um, so that can be another, again, we have, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but so the slow versus the fast, there's room for both of them in the diet. And as Nicole and I are, are, you know, big fans of, it's important to know that like you don't only have to eat foods that are whole wheat all the time. Um, it's okay to eat, you know, white rice or to have things like that with a meal. Um, I had Thai food the other night and I like the sticky white rice that comes with it. So um, it's okay to have that idea. We're big believers in, in the idea of balance in the diet. Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> so our big conclusion on this section, um, as Laura was saying, you know, research has shown time and time again that athletes who get in sufficient carbohydrate for their sport outperform those who do not. So for, and until the research says otherwise, and we're very evidence-based, we say eat pasta, run, run pasta. And Laura actually has a t-shirt with this to um, help, help advertise that to our, to our clients, our patients. Um, yep. I, do. I, I took a great picture wearing this shirt, eating a big bowl of pasta before uh, before the Boston Marathon last year, and it's it's one of my favorite favorite photos of all time. So you too can find that shirt on Amazon. Um, so I might need to brand one, Nicole. I might need to make one. I think so. Yeah. 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 Uh, so let's move into talking about protein. So our protein is um, this picture shows many examples of protein. So protein is really important for muscle development, for strength, uh, for growth. Again, those ligaments and those connections between your muscles and, and really helping, especially in a growing athlete, we wanna make sure that we're developing not only strong bones, but strong connections between those bones, right? So protein um, is something that also helps with feel, making us feel a little bit fuller and more satisfied at a meal. So if you've ever eaten a meal that doesn't have any protein in it, you might notice that you got hungry really quickly afterwards. And that would be, you know, the reason is because this, these guys stick with you a little bit, a little bit longer. So um, if you look at our picture, things like uh, eggs, fish, beef, chicken, nuts, um, 
beans or a vegetarian source, if we have any vegetarians out there, things like tofu um, or seitan or tempeh, there's a lot of different options. Um, and a quinoa is also another source and any dairy products. So milk, um, yogurt, cheese, all of those things are going to be great, great um, options to get protein in your diet. And we really do like to see protein throughout the day. Um, and these can change a little bit depending on what someone's sport is. But I mean, I always, to, to just keep it really simple, you want to think about getting um, getting protein in at every meal and snack throughout the day. And I think I actually have a slide that breaks this down a little bit more. Yep. Yeah. Nicole, I'll pass it to you. All right. Sounds great. Yeah. So this slide really, in a really nice way, illustrates why protein timing is important and why we really emphasize getting protein throughout the day. And as Laura was saying, it's not that everyone's total protein needs are going to be 90 grams of protein, but in general, by getting in sources of protein consistently at every meal and snack, you're really maximizing your absorption because the body does cap off absorption at around 30 grams at any one eating occasion. Um, this is another reason we also uh, really emphasize our, that our athletes, we don't want them skipping any meals because if they're missing a meal or having a meal with really low protein, they're really missing yep. out on an opportunity to get that protein in and help with that building strength and, and development process. Mm -hmm. So like mm -hmm. more towards the, the right side rather than the left. Uh, right, right. Mm -hmm. This is one reason I, I always use this example. Um, I know breakfast is often a struggle for um, a lot of our adolescents and our teenagers. Um, I know Nicole and I both have this conversation a lot with our patients uh, about the importance of breakfast. Your body, you know, say like your gas tank is empty when you when you wake up in the morning. So especially before going to school, you really want to make sure that you're, again, that protein is going to help you stay a little bit fuller for longer. So you know, making sure you're having a source of dairy or some eggs or peanut butter or nuts. Um, <clears throat> one of my favorite breakfasts, I think, is an easy one is um, like doing oatmeal, but making my oatmeal with milk instead of water. And then I like to put a big old scoop of peanut butter in there. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I eat that a lot. And I find that that really kind of like holds me. I need a high protein breakfast kind of, but then you're getting like your whole grains. And then of course you could throw any kind of fruit in there too. But <clears throat> breakfast is actually a really, 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 really important meal. So we've all heard the phrase that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. I don't know if it's the most important, but it's equally important as all the other ones that you're having. Mm -hmm. Um, so, okay, good. I was hoping I put this slide in here. So, um, this is kind of an example of how much protein is in different foods. So I always give, again, I'm not going to make, Nicole and I are not going to make, um, specific recommendations about how many grams of protein every person needs because it does vary person to person. But I always say as a good rule of thumb, um, <clears throat> especially for our growing athletes, like I always like to see them aim for about, you know, 15 to 20 grams of protein. Uh, it can be more, but at a minimum shooting for that at a meal. So what does three and a half ounces look like? So if you look at your palm, obviously our palms are all different sizes, but a palm is approximately thickness as well as size is about three ounces. So typically if you're having something that's about the size of your palm, you're going to be getting at least about 20 to 25. And you can look through this list here um, and, and take note of how many grams of proteins are in different foods. Um, things like, uh, I don't think I have yogurt. Do I have yogurt on here? I don't. Um, so yogurts are typically, if it's a Greek yogurt or like an Icelandic, like a Siggy's, they're going to have closer to like 12 to 15 grams. Whereas a regular yogurt, um, which is still fine if you prefer that, has about eight, eight grams of protein, which is comparable to like a an eight ounce um, glass of milk. So, and note also that almond milk, um, it only has about one gram of protein. So some of them are now there. Uh, there's a few brands that have like almond plus cashew, which are higher. Mm -hmm. um, if you are allergic to dairy, uh, lactate is a, is a great product or, um, or soy, soy milk directly matches the protein content of cow's milk. All right. Our last, our last macronutrient here um, uh, is we're building our athletes plate together. So dietary fats is, is one that we really like to make sure athletes are getting. Um, and I'm sure many an athlete, we get many an athlete in our clinic that is a big fan of peanut butter. 
great because that's one of the sources that we think of. But a lot we do a lot of education around why fats are important. They're definitely a macronutrient that's similar to carbs, have a history of some misunderstanding around their role in the diet. Um, so fats are an incredible source of energy for the body. Um, so when we are thinking about energy sources, we do think of predominantly carbs, but in certain cases, fat can be used for fuel as well. Mm -hmm. yep. and, yeah, and we really like to think of a balance. So again, Laura and I are, you know, really thinking about balancing out things. We're not gonna, you know, we don't want any sort of restrictive approach. Um, so when we're thinking about fats, there's saturated fats, which are the ones that we tend to think of as solid at room temperature. Um, things like butter or maybe some of the fats that'll be in some animal protein. And then we have the unsaturated fats. So these will be um, things like your olive oils. And we really want to get a balance of those. So the recommendation is to get more unsaturated, but that doesn't mean we're, we're ditching the butter. I know I certainly don't. Um, Me neither. <laughs> So we really want to help make sure um, and emphasize getting in, in fats throughout the day and at every meal. They are important for our immune health, um, help us from getting sick, important for our hormones, and they help with nutrient absorption. So we have four fat-soluble vitamins that we take in through our diet with important roles in the body. These are vitamins A, D, E, and K. And if we add a fat source to our meal, we're actually going to absorb more of those nutrients from that meal. So if you're having a nice colorful salad um, as part of your meal, like adding on avocado, cheese, uh, salad dressing, you're going to get more nutrition out of that. So it's actually going to optimize that absorption and that um, the way you can use those nutrients. Yep. yep. Similar to protein, they help us feel full and satisfied, which is also important because, you know, um, our, in our most time, not, not currently when we're mostly at home, but in our day to day, we're very much on the go. So we're looking for how can we, get a meal that's going to give us the nutrients we need and also help carry us through until our next eating occasion. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, these examples, I'm sure many of you are familiar with them, but like things like oils, like olive oil, avocados, which is one of my favorite foods, uh, nuts and nut butters and, and black seeds uh, are, are great sources. So this is sort of, <clears throat> this is kind of sums up uh, a lot of the things that, that we're talking about, like how do we put it all together, right? So this is a really great tool. It was developed by the U.S. Um, Olympic Committee Sports Dietitians, and it's great. It's visual. So we, I know uh, I have so many athletes at all different levels that will literally, I give them a printout, they hang it up in their rooms, in their dorm rooms, in their lockers um, to really help them understand what should my plate look like? What should the balance of the nutrients on my plate look like in different times of training? Now, I do want to add a caveat to this for our growing athletes. Remember that everybody's energy needs are a little bit different. You're going to have some people that have incredibly high calorie needs and some of that can be, it can be genetic. Some people's metabolisms are just really, really fast. <clears throat> and especially during those like growth years, sometimes we need to really like, these plates might not be enough, right? Or you might need to have two plates. Um, so I just want to add that caveat. But when we think about these three plates, if you look at them, um, I really would say even Nicole, and I would guess you agree with this too. The, the easy training, like our weight management plate is one I don't really often use at all with like my adolescence um, and growing athletes because it's pretty low in carbs. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I typically think, <clears throat> look, focus more on sort of the, the plate in the middle, the moderate training plate, as well as the hard training plate, which is the plate in red. So if you notice, if you look at those plates <clears throat> from um, left to right, basically the carbohydrates are the thing that increases the most with an increased volume of training. So moderate training we usually say is somewhere from like <clears throat> an hour, hour and a half, um, or, you know, that hard training plate for some of you might be your daily plate, right? Which is, which is more.
for many of our athletes, they are using hard training um, in their day to day. They need more of those carbohydrates. Uh, Something we also use the athletes plate to illustrate is, you know, we do get athletes in our clinic who are injured, who maybe had to adapt their training styles. They're in their off season. Um, they're not training at the, the same level maybe they would be in their, in their season. And we like to make sure to illustrate that even with lower training, even in the absence of training, none of the food groups ever go away. Um, so we, we really like to emphasize that and to, you know, explain the importance of that since sometimes we do run into that uh, in our clinic. Um, so we, we want to make sure we're getting all the food groups all the time. And then just thinking about how to shift that balance to better support fueling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Laura, if you want, I can kind of take it away for a few slides. I need, I need a breather. I'm going yeah. yeah. <laughs> to let you have know to call. <laughs> you have to do what you like went through the whole presentation. <laughs> yep, I did, actually. <laughs> So this is this slide of this message is something that Laura and I um, bring into our clinic every single day with every athlete. And we've alluded to this earlier in the presentation, and that's really that truly all foods fit. So we are both all foods fit non-diet dietitians. We do not believe in good or bad foods. We don't think that food has morality. So we don't know why we need to give it those categorizations. Um, we really do believe in the importance of balance of nutrients, of food, and, and of timing, and really understanding with education how to use certain foods at certain times to get the results you're looking for. Um, and food is fuel, and it, it's so much more than that, too. So, you know, making sure to, like, have your food as fuel, but also, you know, enjoy your food. Food is social. Food is connection. Um, food is celebration. So we want to make sure to really emphasize all of that. And we do not cut food groups out. We don't cut foods out of anyone's diet unless someone has an allergy or an intolerance and they're medically, it's medically necessary to. Right. Um, right. Otherwise they, they should and could include it in their, in their day to day. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yes. So nutrient timing. So this is, you know, really thinking about practices, competitions, how we use nutrition to get the most out of um, giving ourselves energy for performance and then supporting the recovery process. So this first slide is all about that kind of pre-timing, what to eat before and how close. So as you can see, we have our little graphic of our man on the starting line. Um, I'm not sure what, when this, uh, where this graphic is from, but he is, he's quite styling. But as you can see, as you look out further out from that slide, you're really seeing a uh, larger piece of the pie, um, so to speak, and a greater distribution of the different macronutrients. So you have carbohydrates and you have protein and you have fat. So in that that three to four hour mark, you're looking at more of a meal. As you get closer to an activity, you can see that it really hones in on the carbohydrates and the that slice is getting smaller as you get to that point of starting exercise or maybe starting a race. And that's because, you know, as Laura was saying, when we're thinking about fast carbohydrates in particular and carbohydrates in general, they are our energy and they're our quickest form of energy. So if we're looking at, you know, an hour before or closer to exercise, you can see it's predominantly carbohydrate. We really don't want to get too much protein, fat, or fiber as that can slow digestion and feel uncomfortable in the stomach. Yep. Um, yeah. So, you know, really focusing in on, we have a few examples down the line, but getting something in, carbohydrates, small amount, Gatorade if you're not comfortable with food, a banana, a granola bar. I remember when I was in high school before a race, I'd be given like a goo packet maybe 15 minutes before the starting block. Um, and, you know, that just gave that little boost of carbohydrate in my system. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really kind of thinking about, about that. And a lot of this is about experimentation. So some athletes can have maybe a little bit more protein, a little bit more fat content and mm-hmm. feel fine. Um, some really need, you know, straight carbohydrate. So um, for athletes, really encouraging experimentation, practicing in practice, so that when they get to competition, yeah. they feel like they have their, their go-to formula. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then recovery. <laughs> so recovery is also a, a big and important piece of, of fueling. And Laura has um, always described it to me, and I love it, is the fueling sandwich. So you have your 
you know, pre and your post mm -hmm. and yep. during. When you have that that formula, when you have that recipe for, for fueling and recovery, you're really doing yourself a great service when it comes mm -hmm. to your events. Yep. Yep. Um, so we have what's called the recovery window, and that's within 30 to 45 minutes or so following finishing activity, whether it's um, you know, a race, um, practice, any any sort of um, athletic bout where the body is really in recovery mode and uh, the enzymes in the body are working really hard to replenish stores, to repair muscle. So if we take in carbohydrates and protein in that window, we're actually feeding up the recovery process. We're making it as optimal as possible. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. You may have heard of chocolate milk as a uh, gold standard uh, example of recovery. And that really is because it has a blend of carbohydrates and protein in it, and with it being chocolate, which is one, delicious, um, but two, it gives it that extra boost of carbohydrate that, that your body can benefit from. And then you want that next meal that someone has following that recovery snack to be that nice balanced meal, athlete's plate, getting protein, carbs, and fat, like yep. the example provided. Yep. Mm -hmm. And one thing to remember too is if you are someone that – you are home from practice within 15 minutes and it is dinner time and it is there when you get home or um, that can act as your recovery as your recovery meal as well. So it's really just about making sure that you're getting in carbohydrates and protein in that recovery window. But most people, by the time you, you know, you get you get out of practice and you get home and maybe you take a shower, it's usually a little bit longer. So something mm -hmm. like a chocolate milk, we actually have a great slide Um yeah. This one sort of exemplifies and breaks down what Nicole was just talking about, um, the pre-workout uh, being mainly carbohydrates and some some examples and some ideas in there for you to play around with. And again, everybody's individual. So you want to experiment with what combination or what food maybe makes you feel feel your best. Um, I'm also a big fan of like the Cheerios and the raisins in a in a yeah. little Ziploc bag. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's it can live in your bag. It can hang out in there for a few days if you don't get to it. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of nice, easy options there. And then in that post-workout recovery window, again, our friend, the chocolate milk tried and true. Um, a lot of those like yogurt smoothies that are out there now, like the portable, the Chobani ones and things like that. Um, <clears throat> graham crackers and peanut butter or peanut butter pretzels, one of my personal favorites. Um, you know, half a sandwich or even again, a complete meal if you're going to, and people always ask me what PBAB is. So that's peanut butter or almond butter. So mm -hmm. a little quick, yeah, shorthand there. Abbreviation. Yeah. Um, I'll intro this, Nicole, and then if you want to yeah. Sounds good. I'll, I'll jump back in. I've gotten to rest my voice a little bit. Um, so mm -hmm. Nicole and I often use the analogy of your body is like a car, right? So think about what happens when your car is on empty. Not really good, right? No one likes to see that. Um, mm -hmm. And the car doesn't go. It stops, right? So now think about that in terms of training. If you're not getting enough energy filling your tank up, your body's going to run out of energy. And then that's not going to mean good things for um, for performance, but also your overall health, right? So we're going to introduce this idea of energy availability with another analogy. <laughs> we love analogies here. We do. We love them. We love them. Yeah. Yeah. They make it fun. So I imagine, you know, many, if not all of you have, have a smartphone and probably have at least once run into uh, the low battery situation. You can't get through the manager yeah. and you're, you're forced to go into low battery mode in order to, you know, conserve that power and allow you to use your phone. So if you think about what happens to a smartphone in low power mode, it has maybe the brightness of the screen decreases. Apps aren't refreshing as frequently. I've definitely gotten low enough, like 5% remaining, where it's like certain apps just don't work anymore. It's like yep. you can text and you can use your phone, and that's pretty much it. Yep. So we use this analogy to think, you know, reflect that back and think about, you know, the body is very similar. The body has the fuel that it's given from the diet, from intake, and it's going to use that for the things that it needs to do for things like activity and movement, but also for other functions. So, you know, um, breathing, heart rate, menstrual function for female athletes, bone building, um, all of that takes energy too. And if we are not getting in enough fuel going in, our body can enter its own version of low power mode. Um, which is that energy available state of, that we call low energy availability. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
So this is just another way of looking at it. Um, that the calories that you're consuming in a day minus your calories that you're expending through training leave what's left over um, the idea of energy availability. So we want this to be a positive number. We don't want it to be a low number. So there was actually a study that um, was done by uh, our group at Children's that surveyed a thousand female athletes um, that were coming to the, the, the sports medicine clinic for any reason, right? So it might've just been a sprained ankle or shoulder pain um, or something like that. And this is a crazy number. 47.3% were identified as having low energy availability. So just think about that. That's basically like if you have 10 people in the waiting room, like half of them, right? Mm -hmm. So these numbers have been staggering. And our group has really been looking at a lot of um, doing a lot more screening with this. And we're seeing that there's so many athletes that are falling into this category. So this is, you know, and again, I think uh, to, to reflect back on, you know, Mary, Mary Kane's story in the news, um, really bringing up this idea of low energy availability and the negative the negative impacts that it can have on your body. So this is kind of a really imperative topic right now. So I want to make sure we get through this one today. Yeah. <laughs> so when we're thinking of, and I'm many of you be wondering what to be on the lookout for, because there are certain signs and symptoms. And though everyone has maybe a different presentation, um, these are ones that we see more often than not in our clinics. And ones that we like to put out there for education, and for, you know, our athletes and coaches to be thinking about as far as maybe when does someone need a referral uh, to, you know, like Laura was saying in the beginning, we have a wonderful sports endocrinologist that we work with at the female athlete program. Um, we, um, you know, we ourselves work with the low energy available kind of athletes. Mm -hmm. So some of these signs and symptoms include excessive fatigue. Um, anemia or other nutrition deficiencies, um, which can result from not getting enough in, um, muscle loss, uh, recurrent injury, illness, or infection, uh, mental dis dysfunction for female athletes. But we don't, this isn't uh, exclusive to female athletes. We see this in our males as well, which is why hormone irregularities are also there. Like we'll see male athletes with very low testosterone. Um, and so these are definitely, you know, signs and symptoms we see across both genders. Yep. Um, yep. Uh, difficulty recovering is one that we we hear. Um, Laura, you mm -hmm. may hear out too, like someone who just really tired legs, inability to kind of like feel yep. that powerful spring in the step that they want to, or inability to make strength or performance gains despite yep. all the work that they put in. Mm -hmm. um, we also see, you know, irritability, difficulty sleeping, uh, or ha difficulty staying asleep, and and poor concentration. Um, so, like I said, these aren't necessarily, you know, going to be the same for everyone. But if you have right. if yourself or you notice an athlete is, uh, you know, experiencing these or sharing these, it, it could be worth taking a look at the nutrition and taking a look at the energy availability and seeing, could there be some small tweaks that could be made to mm -hmm. support that athlete? Right. right. Yep. No, it's well put, Nicole. Um, this is just another way of looking at this is so this idea of low energy availability is also the, the more, um, scientific name or the one being used really in a, in a low, well, low, low energy availability is also very scientific. Um, but relative energy deficiency in sport or reds is, you know, another way, um, that we're looking at this idea of low energy availability. So some of you out there might be familiar with the, um, the female athlete triad, which really just focused on females and just focused on bone health, menstrual function and calorie intake. But now we know if you look around the circle in the interest of time, I won't go through all of them, but Nicole just gave a really nice summary that basically being in an energy deficit that can affect pretty much every system in the body. I will highlight for a second growth and development, because again, in an adolescent athlete, we, Nicole and I spend a lot of time reviewing growth charts in our, in our sessions as well for our growing athletes. We will see a plateau in someone's height sometimes when they're in an energy deficit we get them more well fed and all of a sudden we see an increase in growth again same thing with weight if we're noticing that an athlete is all of a sudden dipping off of that that graph that um, growth chart rather, excuse me, that is a sign to us that there's an energy deficit going on there. We need to feed more, right? Because we want you following those nice, uh, nice growth curves, which means increasing in height and weight throughout your adolescent years, right? We don't want to see you losing weight um, or plateauing in your height. We want you all to get as, as tall as you're meant to be, right? 
And this is another diagram. It looks incredibly similar, but this is the one, Nicole, I know you'd agree with this, that really speaks to our athletes uh, yeah. the most because these are your performance consequences. So Nicole really already highlighted a lot of these on that other slide that we created, but this is a whole slide that shows all these different places that your performance, not just the health. I always find that like the parents like the health one better and the athletes are like, yeah, 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 yeah. But what's it going to do to my performance? Well, there's one for each of you. Um, so this is just another way of looking at the potential performance consequences of being in an energy deficit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so when we're, you know, seeing an athlete with low energy availability or relative energy deficiency in sport, and they come in and they're presenting, you know, with these concerns, with these issues that, you know, Laura had detailed on the REDS model, we're really trying to focus in on honing in what the possible cause is. And so there are, you know, the more intentional uh, energy, uh, low energy available states um, that usually occur from an eating disorder or disordered eating. But then there's also the unintentional causes of low energy availability, um, where you're just not getting enough intake or expenditure. And these include, you know, just a lack of education around high energy needs, um, incredibly high energy demands. Yep. Um, Laura, I'm sure you see this too. I see many, so many athletes who are doing, you know, three sports. If they're doing something like hockey or soccer, it's for like the club, the town, and the school. Um, yep. 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 <laughs> Um, so beyond and beyond, you know, lack of education or just really high energy needs. Also, you know, sometimes food allergies make it difficult or if there's any yeah, sort of yeah. medical reason. Yep. So Good. if there's no energy availability, Laura and I are making sure to do a full workup and evaluation and referral when yep. needed to make sure that we're really yep. figuring out the cause. Because if we can determine yep. the root cause, we're going to have an appropriate plan of, of action to remedy it. Yep. Another thing I want to I want to add to that that was great. Nicole hit it all in the head. But um, we have a lot of athletes that are on like um, that are medications for ADHD or like Adderall being one of the common ones. I know there's some others which takes the appetite away. Right. So I know we have a lot of adolescents that we work with trying to just um, kind of help you be able to fuel your body, even though you might not be hungry all day, especially at school, right? Like lunchtime, I know it was really hard when you take those medications that take your appetite away, but your food intake is still really important. Um, or time I know can be a big issue for athletes. Like lunchtime is like 15 minutes, which is crazy. We need to start a, you know, a, uh, March for uh, more more time at lunch, in my opinion. But um, it's uh, you know there's a lot of external factors that can cause this as well. So it's not just that someone is struggling with like an eating disorder, but there could be a lot of external um, things that cause an energy deficit as well. So just to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think those were, I think in the interest of time, I think we're going to have to unfortunately <laughs> cut off there. Um, but uh, that was really, those are the, the bigger, most of this, um, just talked a little bit more about calcium and vitamin D and iron. Um, but um, I think we are unfortunately going to have to stop there. Um, in the okay, interest Laura of, and Nicole, uh, thank you. And uh, for our listeners, thank you for uh, jumping through some hoops to get, get back in. Um, obviously, we're hoping to do Q&A here, but we're otherwise out of time. I'll figure out how we maybe can piece this together on the uh, the recording to make something whole out of it um, and uh, pick back up. We do plan uh, to do additional, you know, uh, sessions on nutrition, sleep, other off the field uh, items. Um, and uh, hopefully we can do some of these live and in person before too long. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, whatever you're looking for uh, audience, let us know. Um, Nicole, uh, Laura, thank you. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll shut this down now and, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make do with the edit, uh, in a few days. Yep. All right. Wonderful. Thanks everybody. Okay. Thank Take you care. guys. Thank you. Be safe everyone. Yep. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Are you kidding me?